Good evening. Along with what I talked about in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 this morning, when you're preaching, there is a time to have a somewhat lengthy introduction, and there is a time to dive right in, and this is the latter. We've got 71 verses to get through tonight in John chapter 6, so we're just going to dive right in and uh, skip the introduction. And John chapter 6 is a well-known story for most people in that it's Jesus feeding the 5,000, but uh, John adds a little bit more color than the other Gospels in some ways about this event. John chapter 6 and verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test them, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. So here we read John's account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And we call it that, Jesus feeding the 5,000. It very well may have been more. In fact, I would dare to say that it was probably more than 5,000 because it seems to indicate that it was 5,000 men not counting the women and children. And so this could have been 10,000. This could have been 15,000. It was a lot either way. One thing that John mentions is that the Passover is near. The Passover is near. And this is the second Passover that John has mentioned in his gospel. He mentions the first in John chapter 2 where Jesus comes in and he cleanses the temple. And this is the second Passover. Now, we know from the gospels that Jesus' ministry was about three years long. And John marks that with these Passovers. This second Passover is kind of the midpoint of Jesus' ministry. And I was thinking about it this afternoon, and, and I might argue, I, I haven't really thought this out all the way, but I might argue that this event, Jesus feeding the 5,000, is kind of a, a central point in Jesus' entire ministry. There is the point leading up to that, and then the point after that. And again, I haven't really thought that through all the way, but it seems like John might even be using that with this second Passover. The next Passover that's going to be mentioned in John is the Passover where Jesus is crucified. And so we are entering a, an interesting period in Jesus' ministry. Up until this point, Jesus has gained large popularity and keeps growing and growing in his popularity. And really after this, it's going to start to dwindle a bit. There's going to be a narrowing out. And again, this event and the, the things that come after that are a big part of why that is the case. Another thing that is interesting in this account of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is that John picks out two uh, disciples in, in this that really aren't mentioned in the other Gospels. And it's two disciples that he's already uh, mentioned as having a role in Jesus' early ministry to some extent. And those disciples are Andrew and Philip. 
Now, admittedly, I don't really know why John highlights Andrew and Philip the way that he, he does, but he mentions them much more than the other Gospels. Um, and, and that's to say he mentions them where the other, the other Gospels really don't. But Andrew is the one uh, who solves the problem. There's a lad who has five barley loaves and two fish. He doesn't think he solved the problem, but uh, Jesus uses that. But Philip is the one who's saying, we don't have even, uh, we, we couldn't even buy enough bread with 200 denarii, which is a large sum of money. But another th thing we get that I, I believe the other Gospels don't mention is that Jesus, where he says, where are we to buy bread? He's testing them. And that is something that Jesus does throughout the Gospels, not just in the Gospel of John. But what he is doing with feeding the 5,000, he's, he's a te teaching the apostles. He teaches them how they ought to minister uh, to these people, not necessarily in actually feeding them, but he's teaching them a spiritual reality that it is their responsibility to spiritually feed these people who are coming after Jesus. This is the fourth miracle that is mentioned in the book of John. Uh, as I've mentioned before, John uh, focuses on seven miracles that Jesus did. This is the fourth. And so it kind of serves as the midway point in that as well. Um, <clears throat> but as far as what Jesus is teaching here, what does Jesus teach to his disciples? I think what Jesus teaches can be well summed up in verse 12. Talking about the, the bread, when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Now, when you just read that for the first time, you might think, well, Jesus is just saving the bread for later. And that's why it said, but would that be so significant to record it? Maybe, maybe not. But knowing what we know about Jesus, knowing how he teaches, Knowing a, a conversation over in the Gospel of Mark, I believe, where he talks about the wear of the leaven of the Pharisees and the, the disciples are so focused on bread, bread, bread. And he says, it's not about bread. Don't you remember feeding the 5,000? Jesus uses physical things to teach spiritual principles. And I believe what he's doing the same with this bread. I don't think he's worried about saving up leftovers. He could turn stones into bread. Rather, Jesus is teaching about these people. That they should be concerned about the people that nothing will be lost in regard to them. That they, they don't leave anybody behind. That they are concerned with the welfare of the people. And that is all the people. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later in the application section. <clears throat> Keep reading with me in verse 15. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea. And after getting into a boat, they started to cross the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So the next miracle that we have recorded in John, the fifth miracle, is Jesus walking on water. And one reason why this miracle even occurs is because Jesus perceives in verse 15 that they were coming to 
they were intending to even come and take him by force and make him king. They were so inspired by what they had seen. Jesus taking five loaves and two fish and feeding this large crowd. He had won the crowd over. They were going to make him king. They were convinced that he's the Messiah. He is the anointed one. But Jesus did not intend to be made king in the way that they were wanting to. Jesus tells Pilate later on in John 18, I believe, that his kingdom was not of this world. And that's what they were trying to do, establish him as a worldly, earthly king. But Jesus, perceiving that they were going to do this, he withdraws by himself alone. And the disciples go to cross the sea, the Sea of Galilee, from one point to another. And while they're crossing the sea, other, train, other uh, Gospels tell us that the sea is boisterous at this time and causing problems for the disciples. And Jesus walks on the sea to them. Now one thing that is interesting about John's Gospel is that unlike what he has just said about feeding the 5,000, he gives less detail about Jesus walking on water than the other Gospels do. He doesn't mention anything about Peter trying to come out and walk to him and sinking and, and uh, certain things about how the disciples were feeling. And I could be wrong about this, but I get the idea that this, though he wanted to record this miracle and uh, he's handpicked the miracles, this shows Jesus' power over nature. This is kind of an incidental in his story almost, kind of a transition point. Um, and that, again, is not to say that it's important, but the details of it are not what he's wanting to get across. He wants to focus on what was done and move on to what happens next. Again, I could be wrong about that, but um, judging by the lack of detail, that would be my conclusion. Keep reading with me in verse 22. The next day, the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Yeah. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of, the, down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. So this crowd returns seeking Jesus. And I want you to note the detail that John gives here. Crowd seeking Jesus. And they know that the disciples got in the boat and they did not see Jesus get into the boat. And there was no other small boat there except one. But Jesus did not enter that boat. Jesus was just, was just missing. Now, they were able to get other small boats and cross over to the side. But if I'm following John's logic here, I believe what he's thinking is that they, the crowd should have been able to perceive 
that Jesus did not come to Capernaum <laughs> by boat and that it would have been too far for him to walk uh, around the Sea of Galilee. Because in verse 25 they say, Rabbi, when did you get here? Huh, interesting question. But Jesus says to them, here's why you came. You didn't come because you saw a miracle. That I turned five bread, five loaves and two fish into a meal for thousands. That, that's not why you came. And maybe he's even thinking, you didn't even come because you perceived that I, I had crossed the Sea of Galilee without a boat. That I walked on the water. Again, I think it's a reasonable conclusion for them to make based on what they've seen. Jesus said, you didn't come because you saw signs and wonders. No, you came because you're hungry. Because I gave you food, you ate it, and now you're hungry again. And he says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. He says, you're, you're thinking about physical things, you're thinking about this next meal. Don't work for that. Don't work for the food which perishes. You need to be working for spiritual food, the food which endures. And Jesus is going to tell them about that food. He says, they ask him a question. What shall we do so we that may work the works of God? And Jesus says, this is the work of God. You, you want to work the works of God? This is a work for you to do. Believe in Him who God sent. Well, I think that's a reasonable thing for Jesus to tell them. After all, He's just done two miracles. That one they saw for sure. One we can perceive perhaps they infer. And He's done many other signs and wonders in front of these people. But they have the I, what I would call audacity to ask, what then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? <coughs> what are you going to do for us, Jesus, to, to make us believe in you? Hey, we've got an idea. Our fathers ate the manna from the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven. Could you do that? Could you bring bread out of heaven and feed us? And you've got to ask yourself, as you're reading this, are they really looking for a sign? No. Are they really looking to believe in Jesus? No. They just want to eat. And Jesus then talks about the true bread from heaven. He says, manna, no, that, that's bread that perishes. That's not the true bread from heaven. He talks about the bread of God which comes down from heaven and gives life to this world. And still they're thinking about food. They say, Lord, give us this bread always. They're not getting the point. So Jesus goes a little bit further to help them get the point. Verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about him. Because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. They were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down out of heaven? Jesus answered and said to them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God, he has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. So let's stop here for just a moment and consider what Jesus has said thus far. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Not only does John record seven miracles in his gospel, but he also records seven I am statements of Jesus. Seven statements where, where Jesus proclaims a spiritual truth about himself. And this is one of them. I am the bread of life. And really, as we will go through these I am statements, uh, we will see the full picture of Jesus and who he is in these statements. He says, I am the bread of life. I am that bread that I've been talking to you about. The bread which has come down out of heaven that you should be seeking. He is their sustenance spiritually. He is what they should be hungry for. Because he has the power to give eternal life. But the Jews have issue with what he said. He said, I am the bread which has come down out of heaven. And they said, wait a minute. He said he came down out of heaven? Well, we know that's not true. Because he's Jesus. He's the son of Joseph. We know this guy. We know his family. He, he couldn't be what he's claiming to be. But Jesus says, don't grumble among yourselves. And then he talks about, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. They shall be taught of God. And all these things, I think what he's saying to these, this crowd is, this is a hard truth, but I know that you don't believe in me. And I know you're not going to believe in me. Not because of, of some predestination that uh, some people like to talk about that God picked who was going to believe in Jesus and who was going to be a disciple of Jesus from the beginning of the world. But no, Jesus saw these people where their hearts were, what their priorities were, and he knew that, they, that it was not in line with what Jesus was and what he was giving them. They didn't want to believe in Jesus. They wanted something far more simple, but not more helpful. And once again, Jesus emphasizes that they should believe in Him. The one who believes in Him has eternal life. Believe what He's saying. Believe that He is the bread which has come down from heaven. Believe that He is the Son of God. And Jesus doubles down on what He says in the next few verses here. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they die. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I give for my, the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. <clears throat> As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as the fathers ate and died, he who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. So as I said, Jesus doubles down. He says, I am the bread of life. Once again, 
And he refers back to the manna that they were talking about earlier. They said, show us a sign. Uh, God gave our, our fathers manna in the wilderness, bread from heaven. Do that. And Jesus says, no. I am the bread of life and I'm better than the manna that they ate. He says, your fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness and they died. But anyone who eats me, eats my flesh and drinks my blood, he will have eternal life. Now, in a moment, the disciples are going to say, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? And while I don't believe with, uh, don't agree with all of their conclusions and what they do with that, I will agree with them that this is a bit of a difficult statement. What does it mean that we should, I, I take this to apply to us as well, if we want eternal life, right? What does it mean that we should eat? the flesh of Jesus, and drink his blood. Well, one conclusion that you might come to is he's talking about the Lord's Supper. Because as he institutes the Lord's Supper, he says, this bread is my body which is broken for you. Take, eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. And then of the fruit of the vine, he says, this is my blood shed for you in the new covenant. Take, drink, do this in remembrance of me. And I would agree that that was part of it. But I'm not so sure that that's the whole of it, of what Jesus is saying here. I actually think it might be something, in, in some ways, that is just a little bit more simple. When you talk about someone's flesh and their blood, you're talking about kind of the entire essence of them. We are made of flesh and blood. And what I think Jesus is trying to teach these people, and he uses a difficult way to, to get it across, but what he's telling these people is somebody who takes Jesus in wholly, entirely, what, what are we doing when we're eating something? Have you ever thought about that? No? Usually we, we don't think about what we're doing with, when we're eating. But we're taking something and we are making energy of it ourselves. Completely and entirely taking it in for ourselves. That's what I think Jesus is trying to tell, uh, tell these people. That we should take in all of Jesus, his, his essence, if you will. Everything that he has to offer, and he did offer all of himself. And so, yes, I think the Lord's Supper plays into that. It is partaking in that sacrifice and partaking in remembrance of him. But again, I don't think it's the whole of it. But like I said, that it is a difficult saying. The point of all of it is to believe in him. Believe in him and follow him and do what he has set out for us to do. And we will have eternal life. Keep reading with me in verse 60. Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this said, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And who it was that would betray him. And he was saying, for this reason I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. So Jesus said to the twelve, 
You do not want to go away also, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve? And yet one of you is a devil. Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon and Iscariot. For he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So as I said, Jesus brings out this difficult statement. And, and these disciples, they recognize it's difficult. But Jesus also recognized it was difficult, I think, from the moment that he said it. And there were simpler ways that Jesus could have gotten across the message that he was getting across. I believe he chose a difficult message for them. And why is that? Well, as it says, Jesus knew that some of them did not believe from the very beginning. He tells them that His words are spirit and life. He's trying to get them to think about the spiritual nature of the things that He said. He said, my words are not about the flesh. No, they're spirit and they're life. And you need to be thinking spiritually in order to get what I'm telling you. But he also said that he realized that no one can come to me unless the Father, unless it has been granted him by, from the Father. I believe Jesus is intentionally winnowing out his disciples, sifting through them. Because Jesus' goal was not to gain popularity. Jesus' goal was to find the ones who would believe in Him. Find them and keep them and not lose them. Do you remember what He said back in verse 39? This is the will of Him who sent me, that, all, that of all that He has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. Those who will believe in Him, those who will actually change their lives for Him, it is His charge for Him to lose nothing, but raise it up in the last day. Jesus is seeking those true disciples, and in order to find those true disciples, He's going to have to have times like this, where He is intentionally sifting through them. Now, he's not necessarily chasing them away. He's trying to get them to understand these things. But he says difficult things for the purpose of turning away those who would disbelieve. Did Jesus himself not talk about this? When he talked about why he spoke in parables? He intentionally covered up some things for those who would not believe. And that made it turn them away. And that's a principle that we ought to think about some as well. So because of what Jesus says, the disciples, a lot of them withdraw at this point. And again, Jesus has been rising, surging, surging in popularity. But it comes to a point where he, he realizes I've done all I can do. I've drawn all I can to me. And now comes the part where he starts sifting and pruning. And so some of these disciples withdraw because of the difficult statements of Jesus. But Jesus asks a question. You do not want to go away also, do you? And the, the way that this question is phrased is saying he, he's not encouraging the disciples going away. He expects that they don't want to go away, but he does ask. He does give them that choice. And Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. See, Peter gets it. Peter has gotten the message that Jesus was trying to get across. 
Maybe he didn't get it when Jesus phrased it like he did talking about flesh and blood. It, it's not clear that. But he does get the point of what Jesus has been teaching. And he does believe in Jesus. And he does know that Jesus is the source of eternal life. And that's what Jesus wanted these disciples to get. But instead, many of them were just chasing after him because they wanted something to eat. But the twelve, save for Judas, they were invested in Jesus. All right, let's talk a little bit about applications from this chapter. That statement that Jesus makes all the way back in, chapter, in verse 12. Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. To me, especially as someone who preaches, that's a powerful statement for me. Gather everything up so that nothing will be lost. Nothing should be lost. And we should be endeavoring to make sure that there's no one lost, that there's no one left behind. Our job as Christians is to be gathering up and gathering in. That's what Jesus was trying to teach His disciples here. They had been through a lot. As I've talked about in other lessons, John the Baptist uh, was beheaded around this time and the disciples had just come out from preaching and they were all excited. Jesus tries to withdraw, but the crowds follow him. And Jesus has compassion on them. And the disciples are wanting to send them away into the city so that they can buy bread. But Jesus says, no, you give them something to eat. You take care of them. We have to have this, this kind of concern that Jesus is teaching. And we have to have this attitude within ourselves that nothing should be lost. And when we see an opportunity to teach someone the gospel, when we see an opportunity to try to bring somebody in, we have to take it. That's what Jesus is trying to teach them and what he's taught us through these holy scriptures. But <clears throat> along those lines, I'd ask you, what are you selling? Being an evangelist is in some ways, or being an evangelizer, going out and evangelizing, is somewhat being a salesman. And the reason that I come to this application is, as they were coming to Jesus, they were seeking to buy something that he was not selling. Not physically, they weren't actually looking to buy anything. But they were seeking him for a different reason than what he was doing and what his mission was all about. They wanted food. He was selling the gospel. And sometimes I think we can hurt ourselves by selling other people something other than the gospel. There are a lot of people out there who have the mindset that we can draw people in to churches by giving them fun, by giving them food, by, by selling them on the sense of community, which I, I don't think that's necessarily wrong. The church is a community. But they, they, they gather all these selling points and they think, we won't bring people into church unless we have this gymnasium, and unless we have this fellowship hall, and uh, we have the, the cookout on this time of the day, and this, this week, and things like that. People aren't just, they aren't going to come in the doors. That's why a lot of churches have gone to um, these contemporary services where they're adding instrumental music. They, they weren't. Uh, having instrumental music before, but now they've opened up and we're going to have contemporary services because that's what brings people in. And they end up selling a concert rather than the gospel.
But I think that we too, if we're not careful, we can get caught up in this mindset of trying to sell someone else on something that is other than the gospel. We need to be preaching and teaching the gospel. And don't worry about bringing somebody in and saying, well, there are a lot of you know, nice young families at our church. Well, that's a good thing. I understand that people want to have people of their own age and, and see kids, but that's not the gospel. And we so much shortchange Jesus and what the gospel can do in people's lives. And we sometimes don't believe in it enough to think that it can bring people into the church. That's what a lot of people in the world are doing, and we have to be careful that we're not doing the same thing. That kind of leads me to this last point. To whom shall we go? It's all about Jesus. It's all about the gospel. We need to be thinking about the words of Peter. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Recognizing that Jesus has the words of eternal life, that He is the Son of God. We need to get our priorities straight. We need to realize that, yes, as I talked about this morning, there's a time to, to go to work. There's a time for family. There's a time for fun. There's a time for all that under the sun. But if Jesus is not first in our lives, if we don't eat His flesh and drink His blood and take Him in fully and fully immerse ourselves in what it is to be a Christian, that is, a child of God, that is, a Christian literally means little Christ, that we are imitating Him in everything, every day, every facet of our lives, we don't take that in. And we miss the point. Remember that Jesus is the source of eternal life. Nothing else. Nothing else is as important. And we should be seeking Him. This evening I ask, have you put Jesus first in your life? If not... Why not? Perhaps standing in the way is your obedience to the gospel, that you have not made those steps in your life. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? You know, that's something that I ask a lot up here. It's not a question to be taken for granted. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? That's a question that deserves an answer, and you have to answer it for yourself. And if the answer is yes... What have you done about it? Are you willing to confess that He is Lord before men? Showing that you are not afraid of, of whatever might, might come? Are you willing to repent of your sins? If you believe that Jesus is Lord, are you willing to change your life <coughs> in order to follow Him? If so, you, yes, you need to repent of your sins. And you need to be baptized. Baptism shows that you are, are willing to put away those sins because what you're doing is you're dying to sin and you are being buried with Christ and you are raised to walk in newness of life. That's in Romans chapter 6 and verses 1 through 4. If you haven't done that, why not? If you are a Christian and perhaps you realize that your priorities are not straight, that you haven't been taking in Jesus the way that He intended you, intended you to. Why not stop that tonight and, and start living for Jesus the way that you should? If you were to come forward and, and I'd be willing to talk to you and confess those things and, and we would be willing to pray for you and you can get your life back on track. If you have any need, won't you come while we stand and sing?